This episode brought to you by Amy, Dylan, Odem Bones, Awesome Possum Blossom, William, Brandon, Dave, Scott, Tristan, Kate, Sasha, Isaac, Ori, Karun, Eddie, Nick B, and Chris. And Chris and the rest of the patrons want you to know that you are loved, you are valued, and you are an awesome member of this horror virgin community. And if you want to hang out with us on the daily, join us in the Facebook group. The only thing that makes Chris Evan not hot is being frozen to death. <laughs> I'd still hit it. Oh, God. I can, I can warm you up real quick, Sevens. <laughs> well, okay, I have fun facts about the holodeck. Oh, is it that no one uses it for what people would actually use it for in real life? There was originally a scene where people actually used it for what it would be used for in real life. I respect that. <laughs> I mean, at least they're addressing the fact that it would be 80% porn, 20% Chris Evan watching Beaches. The movie Beaches. Here's the thing. Chris Evans watching the movie Beaches? I could still jerk off to that. <laughs> 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 Thank you for tuning into Horror Virgin. I'm Paige. I'm Mikey. And I'm your Horror Virgin, Todd, which means I don't like scary movies, but you guys make me watch them. And this week, we watched Sunshine, the 2007 Danny Boyle joint. Now, is this the first time either of you had seen this? Absolutely not. I actually, and this came up in the Facebook group, which I thought was really interesting. So a lot of people have compared this movie to Event Horizon. Well, yeah. Uh, right, rightfully so. It's yeah. very similar. I had to watch this as an assignment oh. when I was in Phil Eisner's writing for horror movies class at oh. UCLA. Phil Eisner, who wrote Event Horizon? Event Horizon, I yeah. I that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, and he actually gave a really fantastic lecture comparing and contrasting the films because he actually does really like Sunshine as a film. And uh, he gave a great lecture on how the theme of this movie is self-sacrifice, which was very interesting. I Oh, yeah. I mean, 100%. I mean, everyone on this mission, even at the beginning, knows that they may very well not make it back. And they're doing this to save mm -hmm. the earth and all of that stuff. So, yeah, no, absolutely. Mikey, was this the first time you had seen it? I've seen it a few times. I love Danny Boyle as a director. Yeah, yeah. He's a very diverse filmmaker. But, I mean, I like Sunshine mainly because, you know, I like science fiction films and they don't make enough of them. I mean, I've never been to space, so sometimes it's hard for me oh. to put myself oh. in those oh. shit. Shit. <laughs> oh, my God, it's like, back oh. again. Oh, no. I, mean, I agree, Paige. I have a hard time empathizing with this movie because the sun has never died in my world. <laughs> in good fun <laughs> i like this movie but like it's hard on the fiction and little on the science oh like, yeah okay they're on a space mission to take a giant nuke to blow the sun up to make it work again to create a second star yeah they're gonna build a second star with inside a dying star mikey that's sort of what i like about it in a very weird way like if you tell me a compelling story i don't give a shit about science i'm with you i've talked about looper before but looper sort of does this i think my favorite way where bruce willis is talking to the other guy about like time travel and all that and he's like how does it work and bruce willis is like don't don't worry about it it doesn't matter just know that it works and move on like i really like when movies do that because i don't really care about the science i care about the story and this movie is very heavy on story in a good way well you're right this one the end game is kind of ridiculous the story's logical it makes sense yes it has some twists and i was like oh this is this is pretty suspenseful even though yeah. in the end i'm like okay this is still ridiculous compare that <laughs> to brad pitt's ad astra movie oh the one that's really more just about the relationship with his father yes but him getting there is also ridiculous like the whole movie from top to bottom i was like i enjoyed it because i have dad issues and it was like <laughs> a kind of a metaphor for that but as a science fiction film not so much i've not seen ad astra but it sounds like a movie you and i could hold each other while we cry through tommy lee jones is brad pitt's dad he's in space the you whole don't have to give is, me the rundown mikey i'm gonna phoebe kate you on this one because I, I don't really care that much and we gotta move fast i don't care that your dad died in the chimney <laughs> you have to hear it he's on a spacecraft by venus that's scanning the whole universe for life yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so, so what you're telling me, I mean, A, the science doesn't make sense, but what you're telling me is that he went so far searching for life when his son was right there the whole time. Kinda. And all he hears from the other side of Venus is, hello. 
It's your dad you're looking for. <laughs> they can scan from Venus to the whole universe and take pictures of all of the planets in the universe. Why did they have to go to Venus? The whole thing. I hated that movie. Anyway, this movie's much better. Honestly, normally hate all the movies we do just because I'm very scared during them. Mm -hmm. There are some moments in this that we'll talk about that scared me. Yep. Sort of dug this movie. I don't think I'd ever watch it again, but I'm not mad I watched it like a lot of the movies you guys make me watch. Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest with you. It's I, I feel like it's a good movie and I I've enjoyed it while I watched it. It's not one that I come back to often. Yeah. It's not a rewatcher for me. It's not Terminator. No. I mean, winky blinky. <laughs> winky blinky. <laughs> yeah, we might be rewatching that one pretty soon. I don't think it's super scary at all, though. I don't know. I I, um, I feel like this is more of a science fiction film. I'll get into the things that scared me the first time, especially. I'll do the same, because there are some moments that scared me for sure. Um, Do you want to talk about... When we're recording this? Yeah, so we should mention that we are recording this on the night that... January 6th, 2021. Yeah, yeah some MAGA terrorist stormed the uh, Capitol building in D.C. And crazy shit is happening, so we may have to stop or break in or whatever. If It's, it's definitely going to bubble in. We've been stopping to listen to the news. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I'm not in a great mood. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna get through it though guys we're gonna power through it but uh if you hear us talking about that very specific event it's because it just happened today it happened this morning yes yeah let's get to this fucking movie though Paige. so we open on a voiceover from killian murphy that's basically explaining the like thesis statement of this movie there's it's a lot of heavy voiceover in the beginning of the movie to kind of set up what's going on. Well, and it plays it again at the end. Yeah, and well, we get kind of his message at the end, but before he records that message, we've got a whole bunch of voiceover. So I hope you didn't miss it, because it explains the whole movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't, because I pay attention. Mikey has gone on the records a few times as going to get snacks during movies and things <laughs> like that, and just missing heavy plot points sometimes. Uh, so what we find out in this voiceover is that our son on Earth is dying, which obviously means that mankind is facing extinction. And there was an initial Icarus mission to restart the sun. Can I say this before we move on? I've got to talk about it immediately. You should not name a mission to go restart the sun Icarus. Yeah. That is a horrible name. And I understand why they failed the first time. And we're about to fail the second time until Killian Murphy's blue eyes saved the day. But that drove me crazy. It's because they literally flew too close to the sun. I know. It's insane. I think it's I think it was ballsy to name the second mission Icarus 2 yeah. instead of a different code name. That's true. That they should have true. called it Electric Boo. I'm sorry. <laughs> Icarus I'm sorry. 2 Electric No, Icarus First Blood Part <laughs> 2. <laughs> that one makes as much sense. <laughs> <laughs> like you could have done New Dawn. There's a lot of sun related puns you could have gone on this mission. Oh, yeah. It should have been called like Sunrise or something like that. Uh huh. It should not have been called, it, it should not have been named after someone that flew too close to the sun and their wings melted and they died. <laughs> yes. Icarus, Breaking Dawn Part 2. <laughs> Breaking Dawn would have been a good one. Yeah. And it was honestly my favorite Twilight movie, mainly because I haven't seen it. <laughs> I can't wait to show you guys that that's the real but I mean new moon is hilarious breaking dawn is where shit gets so crazy like can't wait the craziest <laughs> anyway so the first Icarus mission fails no one hears from them so they send a second Icarus mission that left six months ago from earth while earth was already in a solar winter and the Icarus 2 is carrying a giant bomb to detonate within the sun to create a star within a star. Uh, and it has eight astronauts currently en route to the sun. Now, in the kind of beginning portions of this movie, we do get a bit of a kind of a like montage of the layout of what's in this ship. Yeah. So one of the first things we see is the observation room, which is a room where they can sit and look at the sun uh, at varying degrees 
Well, this is where we see the licensed mental health professional or the Mikey of the mission because he's in there <laughs> sunbathing. He refers to it like that later. It's sort of strange. Yeah. Well, and oh. what we will see throughout the movie and if you watch closely, you notice it. He starts to he's clearly not of sound mind yeah. Um, yeah. because he starts to starts to take on physical sun damage. Yes. Yeah. They're praising the sun, praising the sun too much. Him and that other guy that they are like Donald Trump during a solar eclipse looking right at the sun <laughs> looking straight <laughs> into it yeah. well i mean if i was on a mission in space and i was the mental health professional i mean i, I would think there'd be a lot of time to tan i was surprised and, and this is i think primarily because i'm a fan of alien that they were not in stasis for the bulk of this trip now i have some fun facts as to part of that because it would take them so long to get close enough to the sun how long would it take? Years. Literally years. It takes them seven years to get there. Yeah. Oh, does it really? Yeah. Or at least the other Icarus has been out there for seven years, but it would take a long, long time to get to the sun, which is why on the Nostromo in Alien, they're in stasis because it takes them a long time to travel anywhere within the galaxy. Yeah, you're right. It would take 14 years round trip. Yeah. Which is also why later Killian Murphy sends a message to his family and he's like, I'll see you guys in a few years because it would take that long. I mean, he doesn't make it back. But yeah, I mean, it, it even takes yeah. the message eight minutes to get back. Right. In this scene where we meet Dr. Searle, who's their mental health professional on board, we learn that you can they can only perceive 3.1 percent of the sun's full brightness without causing permanent damage. Uh, and that's mm. for 30 seconds. So, like, that's just telling you how powerful the sun is. Yeah. I'd imagine the sun now is even an, in a little bit of a diminished state because it is starting to die. Right. And after he kind of makes it through that 30 seconds, we get a flash of their basically crew Christmas photo. And we cut back to them eating dinner, which is a strong nod to Alien. Absolutely. Because they're all just around that table, just like an alien. Yep, and he's describing how the sun exposure felt, and he is advocating it like it's almost like a cure-all. And this is kind of where we start to meet the um, other members of the crew. So we've got uh, Chris Evans, who is Mace, and he's kind of complaining about the food, to Trey, who is one of their engineers who was cooking the food. Uh, we know Searle is the psych officer. We've got Harvey, who is comms. We've got Cassie, played by Rose Byrne, who is also one of the engineers. We have Corazon, who works in the garden on board, which we'll see in just a second. And then we have Kappa, who is Killian Murphy, and he designed the bomb and the bomb mechanism that they're going to detonate into the sun. Yeah. Um, and we also have Captain Kaneda, who's the captain of the ship. But as they're sitting around the table, we find out that... The solar winds are much stronger than they anticipated, and they had anticipated not having any ability to send messages back to their families for another week. But now it looks like today is their last day to send their messages, essentially. Yeah. So if you've got something to send, send it now. Yeah, the captain's like, just, you know, final final goodbyes, because there's a good chance they're not going to make it. Even at the beginning of the movie, they know they're probably going to die. Right, because it is an experimental ship. Nobody's done it before. The They've done it before. It didn't work. Yeah, and so these are kind of their goodbyes. So Killian Murphy is recording his goodbye message, and as he's doing it, we kind of cut around to other parts of the ship. So this is where we view, where we get to see their hydroponic garden, where they're growing vegetables, but more importantly, they're mining the oxygen from those plants. It's like a win-win. It's food yeah. and oxygen out of this one chamber, more or less. Yeah. Right. And he says that by the time you get this message, we'll be in the dead zone, so you won't be able to message back, but I know what you'll say. And he basically tells them that it takes eight minutes for sunlight to travel, so you'll see it eight minutes after if they succeed. So if you wake up and you see a particularly beautiful morning, you'll know we've made it, and I'll see you in a few years. Yeah. We see Corazon, who works in the garden, Michelle Yeoh. Uh, she goes to the sunroom, the observation room, to talk to Captain Kaneda, who took Dr. Searle's advice and is kind of looking at the sun. And she gives him a report on their oxygen productivity. So they have enough plants and oxygen growing and living that they can make it to their payload delivery and about a fourth of the way back. So they're ahead of schedule. Um, we cut back to where Killian Murphy was recording his message. 
and he and Chris Evans are fighting, and they make it look like a fair fight, but that's ridiculous. Chris Evans would have trounced his ass. Yeah, Killian Murphy's pretty slim. Spindly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, like, skinny, lanky people are really good at fighting sometimes. Against Captain America? What are you He's thinking? He's not Captain America at this point. He's 2007 Chris Evans. I mean, 2007 Chris Evans is about to find out that he's about to be Captain America. <laughs> Yeah, this is uh, Johnny Storm. Of, yeah, I was, uh, was going to say, this is Human Torch, uh, Chris Evans. Yeah. <laughs> he was still pretty jacked in Human Torch, though. <laughs> he's pretty, he's jacked in general. He was jacked back when he was in Not Another Teen movie. Uh, like, real life, if it's Killian Murphy versus Chris Evans, Chris Evans every time. Yeah, absolutely. Every time. Well, Killian Murphy's eyes have hypnotic properties. Yeah, no joke. When Killian Murphy's recording that message to his family, I could not stop looking directly into his deep blue eyes and just like, ooh, I get it. Like, I understand why women are into this. I mm -hmm. I, I, I understand. <laughs> Thank you, Mikey. I'm I'm not, but I understand. If, like, I'm definitely more of a Chris Evans person. Oh, no, me too. Listen, I am not going to jump either of them, but I get why people want to. Why not both at the same time in space? Oh. Eh, I'll still just take Chris Evans. It's about quality, not quantity, okay, Mike. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> what if you're having sex with Chris Evans? Okay. And you see Killian Murphy's eyes from across the room watching y'all. Be like, Ugh, get out of here. I'm busy. But they're huge, like the sun. Oh, in geez. the sun observation room. Where are we? <laughs> That's only 3% of Killian Murphy's eyes. <laughs> Killian Murphy's eyes. <laughs> in space, no one can hear you cream. <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> anyway, they're fighting, and so Chris Evans has to go talk to Dr. Searle, who's like, hey, come on now. And we find out that the reason he's so mad is because Killian Murphy took so long sending his message that Chris Evans won't get to send one. So Yeah, he won't get to say goodbye to his family. It was very sad. But it was a mistake. Yeah. And so Dr. Searle tells him to take two hours in the Earth Room and get a haircut. And the Earth Room is essentially a holodeck, yeah. is what it is. So he's watching girls playing in the waves. He gets to see a little bit of a forest. And he says that the waves make him feel peaceful. So that's kind of what he ends up watching. Uh, he goes to apologize to Kappa, who's Killian Murphy, and it's basically just, I'm sorry, okay, fine, bye. Like, it's not a real apology, but, you know, whatever. It is a very bad apology. It, it honestly is like an awkward sort of almost a meet cute from like a rom-com sort of apology. Yeah. But they don't ever hook up. Sorry, ladies. It happens off screen. <laughs> I mean, th I will say that there was supposed to be a romance in this movie that was cut. With Rose Byrne? Yes, Rose Byrne and Killian Murphy. That does not surprise me. She fills that role often, especially in yeah. movies of this time period. I love her in this movie. I think she's great in yeah. everything. I, I don't think I've seen her in stuff I didn't like her in. No, I yeah, I've never not liked Rose Byrne. She is always great. But yeah. for some reason I have like a super big crush on her in this movie. So Captain Canada is reviewing the last transmission from Icarus One. And he's watching it and he's listening to the commander of the Icarus One talking about basically where their mission is, how they're about ready to release their payload. And he keeps talking about watching the sunlight and how beautiful it is. And he's going on and on about it. It seems a little off and they end up zooming in on his eyes and they just don't seem right. There's something off. And you can kind of even the first time I watched the movie, I remember thinking, oh, it's, there's something weird. Something wrong with this guy. Yeah. yeah. So we cut to Chris Evans with a new haircut. Thank you. Uh, who is doing. <laughs> Paige clearly has a type. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, I'm, this is pretty obvious. I, I don't think I've deviated from this type once in anything I have mentioned on any of these episodes. <laughs> Chris Evans with short hair is your redhead. <laughs> is my redhead. <laughs> Basically, I dated a guy once who looked a lot like him, mainly because he looked a lot like him. I wish I looked a lot like him. So I get it. I I'd, I'd take that. I mean, if somebody was like, "Hey, you could look a lot like Chris Evans," I'd be like, "Is that an option?" Could I, <laughs> then I could just have mirrors and be done with it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so he's doing maintenance on one of the coolant tanks uh, when Rose Byrne notices an anomaly. They all go to look at Mercury from the observation room. So she basically notices that they're going to pass around the planet Mercury. Yes. So they all go to watch it. And it's literally just a dark circle as they're passing it by. They don't even really see much of it. 
but they seem impressed. It also looks pretty excited cool. excited by it. The effects in this movie, I think, are pretty great. Oh, yeah. yeah. For 2007, I think mean, they hold up real well. I, I think the part of the reason they hold up as well as they do is that they really reserve those effects for space and yes. like the exterior and there's not a lot of effects or weirdness going on on the ship and so they really concentrate on making them look real which i think is really really well done yeah so after they take a look at mercury harvey who's one of their comms guys is checking on their comm systems and gets a transmission and so he comes and plays the file for everyone and it turns out that it's the distress signal for the icarus one yeah they're all like what that's not possible that was seven yeah. years ago and we find out that maybe it was possible because they had solar powered components to the ship and they had an o2 garden much like the one that we have on this ship yeah and they had enough food for their entire crew for the trip there and the trip back. But if members of the crew died, then that could have allowed fewer people to survive on those food resources for longer. Yeah. And even longer if they ate each other. Yeah. I mean, that's not what happened, but right. that could have been an option for them. Actually, you don't know. I mean, we do see most of the crew later on in that sunroom chamber and they were well done. Maybe that's how he liked it. Ooh, <laughs> crispy. <laughs> anyway, so they decide to slingshot around Mercury towards the distress signal uh, because they realize that they're going to pass right by the other ship. Because the other ship made it almost all the way to the sun. And they figure that if the shield is intact, some of the crew could have survived. But even if they don't, there's a reason for them to go to the ship. Now, Chris Evans thinks it's a bad plan because they have a mission. And if people had just listened to Chris Evans, they would have completed that mission and probably would have all lived. Yeah, let's have this debate now. I agree with Chris Evans. I think they should not have stopped and they should have gone for the mission. And they, Kappa's idea was if we have two ships it's the captain's idea it's not kappa's idea yeah it's it's dr searle's idea initially and oh, that's they right. put they leave it up to kappa because he's the chemist or whatever he's the, the weapons guy he's yeah. the weapons, the weapons guy, guy. Yeah. yeah so they basically are like is it worth the risk to have two payloads to potentially be able to drop two bombs and he says yes because he's like hey we get two shots at this instead of just one which is a valid counter argument. However, what we know now, having watching the film, if they had just done their one, it would have worked and they all would have gotten home alive. That we know of. They still could have gone back and got it after they dropped off the first one. No, it would have been too close, I think. It's not a suicide mission. No, but they have a certain amount of time to get far enough away from the sun and start their trajectory home. To avoid damage yeah, the from the new star. Or whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess I guess in that case, it's you're supposed to go. But ugh. and listen, they're not Chris Jenner. They're not allowed to drop two bombs in the same day like Kim and Kanye getting divorced. And then Kanye and Jeffree Star hooking up on the side. Like you cannot <laughs> d deliver two bombs in the same day like that. I did not hear about that. Oh, I you didn't guys hear about didn't the second hear about part. That? Is it because people tried to start a civil war shortly after that news broke this morning? Well, I understand why now. <laughs> Jeffree yeah. Star? Yeah, Jeffree Star. Paige, your face is everything right now. Okay, so I will say what goes <laughs> wrong here is that they could have made this decision to go after the ship. But eight people working on a small spacecraft definitely don't group work well. They all break off and do their own things and they don't double check each other's stuff. And they, I mean, that is true. I don't know about that. I think the thing that we really need to consider is that Jeffree Star is a noted racist. So, like, why? <laughs> is he? Yo, yeah, that's why a lot of people don't fuck with him and won't use his makeup. I did not know that. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. I also didn't know who Jeffree Star was until this morning when Kris Jenner said that he was having sex with Kanye West. So <laughs> weighing all of the options, Kappa decides that it is worth it for them to go to the other ship to get the second payload to have two chances. In running the equations, they think that their trajectory can do it and that they're going to pass close enough by them that it's not going to take too much time off of their, um, basically, mission. Right. And he tells us that they literally mined Earth dry for that bomb. Yeah, there are only two bombs available, the one we have and the one on the Icarus 1. Yep. Yeah. And they can't even get another one to send a third mission. Right. So it's this or nothing. 
All of that being said, he they don't have to do this. They right. don't have to go to the second bomb. They leave it up to Killian Murphy, and he's like, yes, two is better than one. Let's just go get it. Right. Uh, so they decide that they're going to slingshot around Mercury towards the Icarus One. As they kind of make that journey, Dr. Searle starts spending more and more time in the sunroom. And we intercut that with Kappa's nightmare, where Kappa, we find out, keeps having nightmares of falling into the surface of the sun. And Rose Byrne wakes him up and says, nightmare? It was at the surface of the sun? Because that's the only dream I have, too. Which is weird, it's, I think that's weird. It's, it's something the movie doesn't super dwell on, but it seems like everyone's going a little sun crazy. I mean, yeah, it does. I wish they had the romance. I ship them. Yeah, well, I think it's still <laughs> kind of there. It's very understated if it is there at all. Yeah. I really do think that for me, I saw when Killian Murphy and Chris Evans were fighting, I was like, oh, they're really fighting because they both want to be with Rose Byrne. Mm. But we all know she ends up with Patrick Wilson. <laughs> oh right and then and he insidious. beans her with that kettle <laughs> <laughs> best foley work in any movie ever is the sound of that tea kettle bouncing off rose burns head guys watch insidious too <laughs> i watched that clip earlier today <laughs> i was like the news is too much i need to cheer myself up <laughs> and i watched that clip of patrick wilson just like spiraling a tea kettle at rose burns head so funny He's a good thrower yeah. He's good at a lot of Gutter chucked it at her dome. <laughs> anyway, I'm just glad she survives and, and lives to fight ghosts. Experience yeah. what a lot of women in our Facebook group would like to experience, and that is Patrick Wilson. <laughs> You're telling me. <laughs> anyway, so uh, she tells Kappa, uh, I just wanted to let you know, I think you made the right decision. And he says, yeah, but Mace doesn't. And I'm guessing Harvey and Trey don't either. And she says, no, but I do. Yeah. And as she's telling him this, an alarm goes off. So they take off running through the halls and they encounter Trey on the bridge where he basically tells them, I screwed up because in order to change the route, I had to override the ship and I had done all the calculations. But the one thing that I forgot to account for is that this changes our angle of approach to the sun. And I didn't adjust the shields by 0.1%. So it's like, such a small calculation, but what it's done is the sun has now destroyed part of their shields. Yeah, I thought it was 1.1%, but still it's so small. It doesn't, that's not a huge difference, but because of that change in trajectory, like four or five of their shield, four yeah. sun shields are, is like stuck in a, like a locked up position that would right. cause them to burn up if the sun hit it. Right. Which is, I think, a flaw in the system, but okay. Yeah, but Trey is freaking out over it. Yeah. They don't know how big the damage is, so they need to send somebody out to survey it. So Captain Kaneda is going to go, and then Mace volunteers Kappa. Yeah, dude, Kappa got voluntold he was going yeah. outside. <laughs> voluntold to go outside because it was his choice to change the mission. Well, yeah, and I think Trey also wanted to go as well. And I, in my notes, kept calling Trey Prime. Because yes, he, because because of IT crowd. Oh, you know it? Oh my God, that makes me so happy. Yeah, Benedict Wong. Um, he is also in. I think it's season. Yeah, it's season two of What We Do in the Shadows as a necromancer, which is oh. a very funny episode. I yeah, love Benedict, Benedict Wong. Wong. His comedic timing is, I think, perfect, and it's so understated. Anyway, he's in the IT crowd in the final countdown episode. <laughs> And he's yes. perfect as Prime. Anyway. Well, and they don't let him be funny in this at all. He's just serious. But. No, I mean, I understand. And I think he nails this part. He's not trying to be funny. Yeah. Because I really did buy that he feels horrible Horrendous, that he caused yeah. this damage to the ship. And now people's lives are in danger because of him. And what ultimately happens to him. Like, I sort of completely bought what happened to him, you know? Yeah. Uh, so Mace Volen tells Kappa. Yeah. Uh, so Kappa and Kaneda suit up and they have to walk along the shields to close those four panels. And in order to do that, Rose Byrne has to shift the orientation of the ship to give them as much shadow as possible. Yeah. And in doing so, they're going to lose two of their comms towers. She's basically like, we weren't using them anyway. We're in the dead zone. And they're like, well, we'll need him to get home. And she's like, we can figure that out when we get to it. But right now, our goal is to get there. Right. They tilt the ship 
so they go out of the airlock. They make their way to the damaged panels of the shield. And there are four damaged panels about 300 meters out from the edge of the shield. So they repair the first panel, but then a solar flare rips through an unexpected portion of the ship that the team didn't account for. As they're repairing the second panel, the ship resumes control and tries to return the vessel to computer control, which would kill Kappa and Kaneda on the shields. Yeah. And the reason it does that is because the solar flare that hit the ship caused a fire in their oxygen garden. Yeah. So Corazon runs to the oxygen oxygen garden and it is a goner. It is Yeah, and that's like that's like her section. Like that's what she's responsible for. She's the botanist on board, I think. Yeah, you can tell she like really loves that garden. It's like her pride and joy. Oh, she loves it. Like it's unhealthy. (laughs) I don't think it's borderline sexual like you're sort of insinuating. I just think she like that's her job. She takes it seriously. That's why she's there. Yeah. No, 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 no. I just think I just think she's, you know. She's got a real green thumb, is what you're saying. (laughs) They didn't bring extra seeds. (laughs) They they did, but it's more that the full grown plants produce oxygen and they don't have the time to wait for them to grow full again yeah think it through mikey duh don't you understand plants i thought you were a doctor (laughs) i'm not a doctor of plants page or any sort of of doctor at all actually (laughs) he's a licensed mental health professional on a horror podcast imagine but (laughs) what it's doing and because of that fire they're venting oxygen which is changing their trajectory yeah so the ship is like must self-correct or whatever and they're like no override we can't but then uh chris evans is like oh shit no we have to self-correct because if we don't we're dead yeah and then everyone's like no override that we're gonna they, they'll die we can't let killian murphy and the captain die he was in the last samurai he's amazing <laughs> right so they, they literally like have this sort of fight but the captain who's on the outside sides with chris evans on the inside basically says kill me yeah let me die to save the ship yeah yeah because he understands which is super sad but it's the right call Yeah, so they let the computer take control of the ship, knowing that it will kill the captain for sure, and very likely Killian Murphy as they try to close the panels. I mean, it would have killed both of them, but as Killian Murphy's working on the last one, he's like, I can get it. The captain's like, no, get out of here. I got this one. And so Killian Murphy just like, okay, I'm out. And he starts to run to the edge. Yep. Um, They end up flooding the garden with O2 uh, to basically flash burn it. To put the fire out because they yeah. don't have water available. Which is a great, great move. If you've ever seen the movie Backdraft, it's a perfect like case study of how this works. Because that actually would have worked. Of have course seen I've Backdraft? seen Backdraft. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's a perfect film. Kurt Russell. Yeah, it's Kurt Russell. You go, we go. <laughs> I've also been to the Backdraft ride at Universal Studios Hollywood. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> All so right, cool, 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 cool. Killian Murphy takes makes a run for the edge of the shield and Kaneda, the captain, gets a look at full sunlight as he works to repair the final panel. But then as Killian Murphy reaches the edge of the shield, Kaneda closes that final panel. The shield is secure, but he can't make it to the edge in time. So he stops and looks directly at the sun as he does. The mental health professional, Searle, asks, what do you see? And he doesn't respond as he burns alive as the full force of the sun hits the shield. Not super therapeutic. (laughs) Those effects are pretty solid, man. Like, all the effects in this movie are great. And he just turns to dust. It's insane. A lot of uh, lens flares. (laughs) <laughs> yes, it, it is a very lens flare heavy movie. You're right. I mean, it makes sense. Rose Byrne cries because she's super upset, obviously. And Kappa makes it to the edge of the shield, almost doesn't make it. He ends up ducking under the shield, and that's what basically saves him. Yeah. They finally get him back into the ship, but Trey is not taking it well because in order to fix his mistake, they've destroyed the garden and killed the captain, and he is beyond upset they end up having to sedate him because they believe that he is a suicide risk and ultimately is yeah well if you believe that he did it that's actually something i wanted to talk about when we got to it yeah harvey the comms team member this guy's the worst he is the worst 
Uh, but this is where we find out that their oxygen reserves are in jeopardy because now they don't have enough time for the entire crew to get there. Now they have to rendezvous with Icarus One. Well, it sounds like they're in uh, final jeopardy. They have to double or nothing. <laughs> yeah. gotta... Todd just looks down and just says no. Potent potables. Um, <laughs> they have to get to Icarus One in hopes of getting Icarus One's oxygen reserves. Yeah. But as we find out, kind of in like a secret little group meeting with uh, Corazon, who's basically the one giving the oxygen calculations, Chris Evans and Rose Byrne, we find out that there is oxygen, but it's just not enough to get all of them there. Yeah, and honestly, they're not even talking about back to Earth. They're talking about yeah. just to deliver the payload. Like, they at that point know they are going to die. Like, this has become a suicide mission. Yeah. We're all going to die. We just need to get there. And they're just 100% mm -hmm. okay with that, which is amazing. Yeah. If they can't get stuff from Icarus 1. Yeah. Um, But this is, she's basically like, if we don't get to Icarus 1, we do have enough oxygen to get there, just not all of us. And this is the first time we hear Chris Evans' character be like, so do we just let that guy kill himself? Because... Yeah. And she's like, well, even if we did, we'd need to lose him and two more. Yeah. Three out of seven. And he just says, that's a lot of short straws. It is. So we cut to Killian Murphy, Kappa, goes to check on the payload. And we find out that it's a bomb that's essentially the size of an airplane hangar. Yeah, it's huge. It's massive. Maybe even bigger than that. It looks like the cube from Cube. It does look like that, yeah. Spoiler alert, it's the cube from Cube. <laughs> <laughs> they were in there? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Powered by the, the explosive power of different colors for different rooms. <laughs> it's an explosive. We've already dropped them in the sun now. It's up to the seven people to figure out how to get out to, to restart the sun. So that we can have cube two hypercube or whatever the second one is called. Right. And that's the bright light at the end of the, when they open the cube. There you go. That's the restart the sun. Perfect. But so Cassie comes to kind of hang out with him while he's working and she's scared and sad that she knows that they won't make it home. And, and he's like well we always knew there was a possibility And she's like but now it's for sure Like yeah there's a very big difference Between a possible suicide mission And a definite suicide mission Right so she's asking Kappa if he's scared And he says no and he basically Talks about how he Kind of expected this to potentially Be a suicide mission and He talks about how important their mission is And how the bomb sequence will go and he thinks it will be beautiful, so he's not scared. Which is, you know, weird, but whatever your reason is, that's fine. I mean, he's not wrong. And also, I don't know if he built the bomb, but he he's like the guy who knows all about it. He explains how it's going to work, right? Mm -hmm. And we see later, it actually is sort of pretty. Yeah, it is pretty. It is pre I, but I like how it's like, I built this bomb. I'm the only one who could do it. And at the end, it's like, you just plug this cord in and push the red button. Yeah, it works yeah. like every other bomb ever. So, I mean, <laughs> I think anybody, Chris Evans, Rose Byrne, anybody could have done it. Oh, he's definitely... Man the Ben Affleck of this Armageddon. <laughs> oh. oh my God. Oh, I, yeah. The first time you brought up to me the idea that it makes no sense to train drillers to be astronauts for Armageddon, that you should have just tra trained the astronauts to drill. I have never, I haven't been able to watch that movie since because I'm like, <laughs> God damn it, he's right. He's right. Yeah, what job is more difficult to learn, a goddamn astronaut or drilling? I'm not saying drilling's easy. I couldn't do it, but I also couldn't be an astronaut. Let's say worst case scenario, they need an advisor. That's just one guy you take with you to the asteroid. Yeah, not a whole not a whole crew, but then we wouldn't have the movie Armageddon. So like, <laughs> you know, catch 22. <laughs> we cut to Dr. Searle is in the observation room again. And he's starting to show damage from sun exposure. It looks like he's been sunburned over and over and over. Yeah, just consi but like really bad sunburn. Like as if somebody was walking in the desert. Like his lips are bad. He looks like a rotisserie chicken at Kroger's heated lamp that's been there all day. <laughs> so delicious. Yes. <laughs> Which is why they have enough food to make it back. I do I do find him very attractive Mikey, no. as well. I've seen that particular actor in a number of things. I think he's Oh yeah, good he's looking. he's he's a good actor. 
Yeah. Yeah. His name is Cliff Curtis. He's solid as fuck. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. So their ship is now alongside Icarus One, and they kind of dock the ships together. So they suit up, they walk from one ship to the other, and this is where the subliminal messaging in the movie starts. And it gets me every single time. It doesn't matter how many times I've seen the movie, it makes my skin crawl every time. What's subliminal messaging? Okay, there's a whole section of this movie with subliminal messaging in it. Did so you, give did us examples of, you, of it. Come out. This scene. So the scene where they're going from Icarus 2 to Icarus 1, we get flashes of crew member faces. Oh, that's not subliminal messaging, Paige. That is in your fucking face messaging. And the first time it happened, it scared the shit out of me. I'll be honest with you. Yeah. Because okay, I wasn't expecting go. it. But every time the flashlight crosses over where the camera is, yeah. like you see it fade to white really quick. One frame of one of the Hawaiian photo pictures or whatever. Yeah. And of each individual member. And then we get the whole crew. Yeah. Yes. It was very Ugh, the first one scared me because I wasn't expecting it. They start out fast and then they slow down. So like the first one is blink and you miss it. The second yeah. one lingers a little longer. The third one definitely lingers. And then the, the final one really lingers. Just like me. <laughs> 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 the first time it's over in a flash. The second time lasts a little bit longer. <laughs> I see where this is going, Mikey. Fourth one. I'm, I'm asleep already. Uh, <laughs> I remember the first time I saw this movie, I remember kind of missing the first one, but feeling unnerved and not really knowing why, and then catching the second one. Yeah. And then I slowed it so I could see each frame. Yeah. It really is just one frame the first time. It's so fast. It's so fast. Every, every time I watch this movie, even though I know it's coming, it really creeps me out. And essentially what you're seeing are pictures of the crew members of Icarus 1, uh, and Danny Boyle did it specifically to make people uncomfortable. <laughs> It worked. Mission accomplished. Yeah. Unlike the mission of Icarus 1. Yeah. Well, it's basically, <laughs> Am I right? it's like, how how do I show you without telling you that something bad is going to happen? And then that's kind of how they do it. So they get to the ship and the air is full of dust and they kind of joke that they're like, yeah, human remains. But it turns out that, yeah, that's exactly what it is. That's what all that dust is. <laughs> they accidentally knock something down into the ship, which is like a tiny little jump scare. Uh, they decide to split up. Kappa checks the payload, which is active and can still be detonated. Uh, Harvey checks the garden, which has seven years of unchecked growth. So allegedly they're saved. They have found enough oxygen. Chris Evans plugs what looks like headphones into the ship and just like one cord, like a coax cable. <laughs> it honestly, it's not even like a, a headphone jack. It is like a guitar cable. It's a, yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. quarter inch. It's not an eighth. <laughs> I honestly wanted to like back away and have him do like a Prince guitar solo. <laughs> yeah. Get ready, Icarus One. Are you ready to run? Are you? <laughs> yeah. He was turning it up to eleven. Okay. <laughs> um, but what he finds out is that all of the subsystems are fine and the ship should be running, but there's no information from the flight computer. So he goes in search of what could be causing the issue. Yeah. They then find the group photo, and this is when we kind of realize that that's what we've been seeing subliminally yeah and they can't find the crew and they can't find their bodies which is a little weird but they trigger a message from the ship's computer from the original commander of the ship so okay hang on i got the impression that it just started playing yeah which i thought was weird and then when we find out what's happening is happening that that captain is still alive mm -hmm. i think he started it i think so too yeah, yeah. but basically it says that they've abandoned their mission their star is dying. All of their hopes and dreams are foolish. Basically, God wants them to die, so we're going to die. Yeah. And so we essentially, at, at the time, they're like, ah, it doesn't make any sense to me. Well, at the time, they don't perceive a threat. Like, he, they assume everyone's dead. So they're like, well, this seems crazy, but let's just get what we need and go. Yep. Can we talk about the spectacular failure of Icarus One's mental health professional? <laughs> yeah. I, hey, guys, hot take. Maybe they didn't have one, and that's what happened. <laughs> mental health is important. Well, I think it's interesting to note that the mental health professional from Icarus 2 is the one that hears that message and goes to the sunroom. Like he already knows. Like he has figured out what has happened. Because the next scene we see is Chris Evans found out that there's a coolant issue so they can't fly Icarus 1. So essentially it, they shouldn't have come. It's useless. They can't even take the oxygen. 
There's nothing really that they can do. And while he's doing that, Dr. Searle goes to the sunroom. Dr. Searle, Dr. Searle. Dr. Searle, Dr. Searle, Dr. Searle. All of the bodies of the crew are sitting there dead, burned alive from direct sun exposure because they opened the observation filter all the way. And as they discover this, the ships decouple and they all rush back to the airlock, but there's a hull breach and they're losing atmosphere. So they're going to have to make the jump from one ship to the other. So there's an argument about who gets to wear the one suit that they have. They decide that it's Kappa because he's the one that needs to plug in that one plug and press the red button. (laughs) (laughs) But Harvey, who is the acting captain, is like, fuck you, I'm the captain. That's what I was going to say. I was like, they don't all agree because Harvey, who I... I love the guy who plays Harvey. He's in Ballers. He does a great job. Yes. And he does a great job in this as being this like scared asshat who's like, yep. get out of that suit. I want to wear a suit that looks like it was made by the Trump family. Let's do this. <laughs> and like, yeah. anyway, so, but they don't. They're like, no, what are you going to do? Be the captain of nobody? Like, no, no one listens to you. You're the comms guy in a, yeah. on a ship that has no comms. You're worthless. You're not getting the suit. Yeah. So what they do, Chris Evans rips the insulation out of the interior of the airlock and wraps them in it. And they open the airlock and jump from one airlock to the other. But somebody has to open the airlock for them. So Searle, Dr. Searle, offers to stay behind and open the airlock. So they make the jump, but Harvey gets off course and freezes to death. So I thought Searle was going to be like, so I thought this movie telegraphed like him becoming the villain or whatever. Yeah. And then uh, he was like, you know what? I'm kind of losing it. I'll just stay here and die. Y'all go save the world. Yeah. (laughs) Which I thought was redeeming. I thought it was redeeming too. Yeah. Yeah. I think he empathizes with that other captain. I think he's starting to feel the same way. Yeah. Oh, I definitely think that he was going to go the way of the other captain. Yeah. If he doesn't do what he does here. So it's good that he does. Although if it's already a suicide mission, does it matter if you die 20 hours before everyone else dies? Like I, yeah, it's not a huge loss. I think at that point. And I think that's the way he sees it. He's like, listen, we're all going to die. I'll die now. So you guys can actually complete the mission. Yeah. He's like, I'm the mental health professional. Like, I don't have anything to do with this. (laughs) I'm not going to walk you through your coping with your suicide or anything. I'm just I'm the mental health professional. I can't plug in a bomb and hit a button. (laughs) It takes two (laughs) cords to plug in. How could you ever figure that out? I have a liberal arts degree. (laughs) (laughs) Also, can we stop and talk about how incredible the soundtrack is for this movie during these scenes? Yes. Oh, yeah. The the sound design of this movie is great. I don't know what that one song is that goes through these scenes and then at the end, but... uh, I think it's just the score. It's amazing. So Chris Evans and Killian Murphy make it to the other side, although Chris Evans has some frostbite from being in the cold and not having a suit. Um, But back on Icarus 1, Dr. Searle walks to the observation room and sits down because he knows that as Icarus 2 moves their shields... He's going to be exposed to the full force of the sun. So Cassie says goodbye to him from the comms on Icarus 2. He doesn't respond. He just sits and lets the sun wash over him as the shields are removed. And he dies with the rest of the crew of Icarus 1. And that's how he got the name Sun-Dried Tomato. (laughs) Is that what they called him? Delicious with (laughs) pasta. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they find out that the airlock was decoupled manually, but it wasn't any of them, which only leaves one possibility, Trey. Right. But he's been drugged this whole time. Yeah, supposedly sleeping 23 hours a day and barely moving the hour he's awake. Right. But they also know that when they lost Searle and when they lost Harvey, they lost two breathers. So if Trey dies, they can make it to the payload with the oxygen they have. And so Chris Evans volunteers to kill him. He's not he doesn't tell them how he's going to do it. He basically is like that's between me and him. But unanimous decision required. Everyone votes yes, except for Cassie. And even though she says no, he gets up and he's going to kill him. And so he goes to the medical bay and there are two scalpels missing. That's a very important detail. Oh, okay. Yeah. So maybe he does kill himself. Yeah, I think he did actually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, There's also a theory that potentially when we reveal who else is on the ship that they killed him and left the scalpel to make it look like he killed himself, potentially. I think he killed himself. That's my personal interpretation. 
Uh, yeah. I, I might be wrong. I'm not sure the movie proves it either way. Yeah. But I could definitely see why the fact that there are two scalpels missing. We know the captain of the Icarus one has one. Right. The other one we apparently see when we see Prime. Right. Or when we see this guy. Sorry. Right, right, right. Now, Chris Evans goes in to kill him, but finds that Trey has already killed himself or been killed. Either one. It doesn't really matter. Right. Um, and he, at this point, blames Kappa for diverting the mission and rubs Trey's blood on his hands. Literally. Metaphor slapping him in the face right there. Yeah. Yep. That's a little dramatic for my taste. It's true, though. It is a little dramatic. Yeah. He's not wrong, though. Oh, yeah, Paige, but he could have just said it. Yeah. Or he yeah. could have picked up the blood and been like, this blood's on your hands. I mean, but to yeah. go all the way with a dramatic gesture is dramatic. Yeah. But they get closer and closer to the sun. They're almost there. We cut to Kappa running basically tests of the payload. And he has the ship run a biometric update for the crew to check oxygen consumption. And the ship is basically like, oh, you're all dying and you're not going to live long enough to deliver the payload. And he's like, please clarify. And he's like, well, you guys are going to die in 12 hours, but it takes 19 hours to get there. And he's like, well, we have four crew. And she's like, no, you have five crews. And he says, who's the fifth crew member? And she just says, unknown. Did you think for one second it might be Harvey? No. <laughs> I, I really sort of wanted to see Harvey, but he's got like one arm. He got defrosted by the sun or something. <laughs> and he's like back to take his revenge. I was hoping no, alien. I, for some reason, figured out, like the second they were like, there, it was manually decoupled. I was like, it's the, it's the other captain. He's alive somehow. Like I knew from that point. I didn't have that thought, but I do like this. Because it's very possible for that captain to stay alive for the seven years because there's food being grown in the oxygen cha chamber and all that stuff. So I really liked this twist, if you can call it that. Right. Uh, so Killian Murphy goes to the observation room and the sun is dialed way up. <laughs> Um, yeah. And he sees an unidentified body sit seated on the bench. And he has this very strange conversation with him of like, are you an angel? Has the time come? And it's very clear that this man on the bench is not dealing with reality. Yeah, he's uh, not there. Yeah. He sounds like a religious zealot to me. Yeah, a little bit. Also, and he's wrong because he said that I want to. Does this where he says I want to be the last one? Yes. Me and yes. God. Yeah. But the people on Earth still exist, so, like, I don't think that would happen. Well, but he, he basically says, God told me to lead everyone to heaven. So, yeah. like, he views himself as a sort of almost Christ-like figure where by destroying the sun and not allowing them to restart the sun, he is then delivering everyone to heaven. Yeah. It's it's megalomania for sure. Um, But what we reveal is that this is the commander of the Icarus One, uh, Captain Pinbacker. So, yeah, it's real strange. He's also fully naked the entire time, but yeah. they like make it so you can't see it because it's shot in a very weird, but I'm into it way. Yeah, it's like wavy. Well, he's also badly burned over his whole body. Yes, tanned. Yeah, he slashes Kappa across the <laughs> chest with the extra scalpel. And they're not like regular scalpels. They're like the... Like the motorized knives you cut yeah. turkeys with on Thanksgiving, or I've only ever seen those in movies, but like they look like that. Yeah. His whole body looks like Todd's feet. <laughs> but do my feet have scabies? Like what's wrong with them? They've been exposed to the sun too much. Your feet are <laughs> worshiping the sun. I'm not saying they don't have scabies. <laughs> It's like my feet have leprosy, Paige. Like, I don't understand why he keeps calling it out. They're just a little hairier than normal. Or, as I like to call it, hobbit-ish. Yeah, I was going to say, they stop for 11 They look, Yeah, I mean, they yeah. go on the best adventures, Paige. No, they go on the adventures that involve the most walking, and that's why they have those feet. That's how I stay so fit. Oh. Long walks to Mordor. <laughs> <laughs> he runs down the hall and calls for anyone to try and alert them that Pinbacker is on the ship. And Pinbacker ends up locking Kappa in an airlock where he's also losing a lot of blood. I actually think Kappa locks himself in because he's trying to like put on that vest that'll stop the bleeding or whatever. And he's trying to stop the captain from killing him. He is the captain locks the door from the outside. Oh, I thought he locked it from the inside. He locks it. No, yeah, outside. he gets locked into the airlock. No yeah. shit. Okay. Yeah. What is that vest, though? A compression vest? Yeah, it's yeah. a compression vest to like, put pressure on the wound. Oh, okay, yeah. so they just had him around the space station. I'm like, okay, if you get injured, put this on. 
I think it's uh, to combat explosive decompression. So, like, if you're coming in and out of the airlock, it could help maintain the pressure on, on your body, maybe. I'm not a science person. Scientist. <laughs> <in a> science. <laughs> Tell me about compression sh shirts. I just use them to work out. What else? Do you, what are you using for in space? I mean, if you're a drag king, you might be using them to, you know, perform, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, so we cut to Mace in the engineering room where he finds that someone has removed all the mainframe panels from the coolant and destroyed the mechanism for putting them back down in the coolant. And without all of the mainframe panels in the coolant, the ship is not going to function and they're not going to make it. Uh, as he's doing that, Corazon sits in what is left of her garden and sees a small sprout growing in the ashes of the former garden. Yeah, this is a metaphor for hope, her finding this. Yeah, you know, which works because she dies like minutes later. <laughs> a metaphor <laughs> for hope and how hope is not worth having apparently in this movie the power goes out and cassie calls out for kappa but nobody can get any information from the computer or find out where anyone is chris evans goes to investigate so does cassie and as cassie moves past the camera down the hall we can see pinbacker coming after her so he follows her in the dark mace brings the computer back online and sees that kappa is in the airlock and kappa uses the mic in one of the suits to tell him that Pinbacker's on board and he's trying to destroy the mission. And Mace tells him that the mainframe's out of the coolant and he's going to have to manually reset it. So he lowers himself into the coolant and starts manually pulling the mainframes down into the coolant. And when we see the uh, mainframes coming out of the coolant, it's actually a really cool effect. You hear Icarus's voice slow down and like... Yeah. Like start to warble, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we saw earlier when... Chris Evans dropped a wrench into this coolant that it like froze his hand very quickly. Yeah, it's very, very cold. quickly. Yeah. And he spends like the next three minutes in this substance, whatever it is. Yeah. And there's just no way you're going to survive. Like, yeah. Um, as that's happening, Cassie hides from Pinbacker in the room where Trey killed himself mm -hmm. and picks up the knife that Trey used to kill himself, allegedly. We cut back to Chris Evans, who climbs out of the coolant, where he's managed to get part of the mainframe online, and then he moves on to the next set of cooling plates. Cassie stabs Pinbacker with the scalpel Trey used, uh, while Chris Evans climbs into the next tank for the other mainframe. With some of the mainframes back on, they're able to enable portions of the computer, but we get a shot of Corazon in the garden, who is dead, holding her plant. Yeah, false hope. I know. I know, man. Cassie goes through one of the airlocks to run away. Chris Evans, as he's trying to get the third set of plates down, is clearly dying of hypothermia. Yeah. Kappa has to force the bomb into the sun and detonate it manually. At least that's what Chris Evans tells him. Yeah, he's like saying this through the radio. He's like, you've got to get this bomb out because I can't do anymore. I'm dying right now. Yeah, like I'm I dying now. If I manage to get the computer back online, I will die in the process. Yes. And then it's on you. Yeah. And then, he, and then but Killian Murphy is like, I'm stuck in an airlock. I can't do anything. And Chris Evans is like, yeah, I'm dying. Fucking figure out your shit. Let yeah. me just, I've got a lot on my plate right now. So he goes down into the third set of plates. He manages to get them to lower, but it catches his foot as he tries to get out of the coolant and he freezes on the edge of the coolant pool dead. Meanwhile, Kappa puts on a suit and gets a welding torch and burns his way through one of the airlocks, straps himself in, opens the opposite airlock, causing explosive decompression to blow that door out because of the hole that he drilled. Yeah. Which also sucks out Corazon's body. Oh, that was brutal to watch. Oh, and that shot is really unsettling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was like, oh, God. Yep. But it does allow Kappa to climb back into the ship with his suit, where he manually decouples the bomb with the emergency separation procedure, and he knows that they have four minutes for booster ignition, but it doesn't matter because they're not going to make it anyway. So he makes his way back through the ship towards the payload. He trips. He has less than two minutes left. He gets back up, climbs through the airlock, and jumps from the ship to the payload because it's already decoupled. And we get kind of a flash of the dreams that he had where he was falling into the surface of the sun as he's literally falling towards the surface of the sun. He makes the jump from the ship to the bomb and finds that Cassie is also there, but so is Pinbacker. Yeah. 
And this is where Pinbacker says, for seven years I spoke with God. He told me to take us all to heaven. And he's dangling Killian Murphy kind of down the side of the bomb, preventing him from getting to the panel that he needs to trigger it. Cassie tackles him and they rip the skin off of Pinbacker's oh. arm. Oh, yeah. Oh, I hated this Which so much. Which is the best part of the rotisserie chicken. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> that loose skin? Yeah. Ooh, so <laughs> choice. It's just got the seasoning. <laughs> But that's what happens to Rose Byrne, though. You never see her again after they fall. She's over there eating the rotisserie chicken. Yes. That's, you, she wants to go out happy. They fall yeah. together, and she's just like, finish it. And so Kappa gets up and manually detonates the bomb, and it is beautiful. And for a moment, we get a montage of all of the dead people. Um, we see Chris Evans frozen. We see Corazon's body floating. And we cut back to Earth where the sun rises and it's just a little bit brighter that day as his family plays the last message he left them. Well, and then the kids get up and like go wa start walking away in Australia yes. where they oh, are yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's covered in snow. And then you see the sun light up. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, eight minutes ago they pulled it off. Yeah, they made it. Yeah. I also like, I like when he's setting off the bomb where it's like, Kind of like cube hypercube where you're like, you don't really know what's going on. It's like sparkling all around and the sun comes in and pauses in front. And he has a moment where he touches the sun. Mm -hmm. and then Yeah, no, up. I thought that was awesome. I really love the way that once he goes yeah. into the sun, it starts to fuck with time. You know, because that is probably what happens is what they um, say. I think you just burn up. But if it was a black hole, I would believe this more. Yeah, yeah. It sort of handles it like a black hole because a black hole is just the opposite of a sun. Like it is a sun that has collapsed on itself. Right. And now it is a black yeah. hole. It's a gravity well. Yeah. Yeah. So it would be, I'd imagine, just the reverse of that. So it would probably fuck with time, too. I like that. It's not possible that they could have shot themselves into the sun like that. But it's cool that they're playing around with that. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think it was cool. And him. I, and I feel like the theme of the movie is like him be like, it's kind of like nihilism kind of versus like the greater good, though. I, I feel like there's a. There's a lot of characters talking about they know they're going to die. Him and Cassie have conversations about it. He knows he's going towards death, but they know that they need to restart the sun to save everything. And like he seems like he is pretty content with his death by the time it happens, knowing that he has saved the sun. I don't know if it's really nihilism, if it's for the greater good. I feel like they wrestled with it. Yeah. And like some characters went the nihilistic way, like the captain. Uh, Pindecker or whatever. Yeah. 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 Pindecker. Yeah. So I think I feel like it was like a like a versus like that's yeah. like, that's what it means. It was like hope versus like, you know, nihilism. Yeah. Because ultimately, even though everyone ends up sacrificing themselves, they do succeed. So it does give hope. Yeah. At the end of the movie. And, and that's, that's the, movie. the movie. So having seen the movie, having talked about the movie, what do you guys think about Sunshine? I still like it a lot. Yeah, I still think it's a really good movie. It's it's never going to be one that I rewatch all the time, but it's a good movie. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't hate it. Like, it scared me in certain spots. It wasn't super scary. Like, when they ripped the arm flesh off, I yeah, that's literally super gross. squirmed. I was like, oh, <laughs> gross. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the flashes of the, what you call the subliminal messages page. Yeah. The first few of those really got me, and the rest just made me feel really unsettled and just uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But it's not super scary, other than in those moments right yeah but yeah I, I definitely think that you could watch this as a horror virgin and get through it just fine there'll be a few moments that you cringe or feel weird but mm -hmm. you can get through it and i think it's worth seeing it's not bad yeah are we ready for some fun facts yeah do you have some fun facts for us page i do i want Noise. your fun facts to shine upon me like three and a half percent of the sun okay cool <laughs> don't do more though and mikey don't look directly into page <laughs> She's looking right at me. Uh, look away. I like how she's pushing the mic with her nose <laughs> <laughs> as she leans in. So fun facts. So the opening Fox Searchlight logo at the very beginning of the movie is actually played backwards so that it ends on the sun hanging over yeah. the hills. Oh. Yeah. I thought that that was very cool. Mm -hmm. So part of the reason that they have the actual garden on the ship is because they spent time with NASA asking about what a large, long-term mission like this would take. And in NASA's planning for future missions like that, they had plans for astronauts growing and making meals instead of using free-dried pre-made pouches and for harvesting oxygen the way that they do in the movie. Yeah. I mean, you can't survive that long on Dippin' Dots and Tang alone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they had rotisserie chicken. <laughs> yeah. That was rotisserie captain, Mikey. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Uh, <laughs> the reason why the crew in this movie is so diverse is because Danny Boyle believed that by the time that Earth would launch a mission like this, everyone would have to have funded it so that all of them would have come from different places on Earth, which is kind of interesting. Back then, uh, you know, maybe, but now you would have half the planet being like, the sun's not dying, we're fine. <laughs> yeah, You're insane. It's just like Game of Thrones, winter came, summer will be back, it's fine. <laughs> the moon is trying to steal the sky election. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in preparation for this movie he actually had the entire cast live together in dorms before production no started so that they could function like a crew the script itself went through over 30 drafts and one of the earlier versions featured a romance between killian murphy and rose Byrne, where they had sex in the oxygen garden but they Ooh. couldn't they they felt like they couldn't make it believable which i don't understand how that wouldn't be believable i think it'd be believable but whatever i think that'd be believable yeah, yeah i, I so believe that too. it's killian so murphy he's yeah. gonna get it if he can get it his favorite scene in the movie is the four character vote scene on whether or not they kill trey which is interesting. Yeah, that's a scene, man, because everyone's like, yeah, kill him, except for Rose Byrne. And he's like, yeah, he had just said it has to be unanimous. And she says no. And he's like, well, I'm going to have to kill him anyway. <laughs> uh, so when talking about this movie, he actually says that a lot of people miss the detail that two blades are missing from the drawer, uh, which is yeah. meant to suggest that Pinbacker has taken them and killed Trey and made it look like a suicide and is taking the other one to kill Killian Murphy. Oh, okay. Oh. So the suicide was staged, at least by Danny Boyle's interpretation. By Danny Boyle's interpretation, it was staged. Um, he also has commented that he thinks that Chris Evans' death and the way that Killian Murphy responds to it uh, says that it was kind of homoerotic. So, like, I think maybe that's why they cut out the other romance. I don't know. All right. <laughs> yeah, the scene where Killian Murphy falls down because he's trying to get to do the jump from the ship to the bomb where he can't get up. They put a camera in his helmet and then they didn't tell him, but they had crew members lay on the suit so he couldn't get up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and he didn't know. Like he knew there oh. was stuff on him, but it was too late. So he's like struggling against it. And that's a very real struggle. Yeah. I mean, I thought he was just a great actor, but now I know that Danny Boyle just pranked him. Yeah. <laughs> I do love that shot when he's jumping from the ship to the bomb. Yeah. Like, there are so many very stunning visuals that I love about this movie. Yeah. Uh, the end sequence uh, at the snow-covered Sydney Opera House is actually filmed in Stockholm, Sweden, where they basically superimposed the opera house over their scenes. Oh, yeah. Because Australia doesn't typically get that much snow, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so at the very end of the movie, the woman who watches Killian Murphy's message, it's supposed to be his sister, and she introduced Danny Boyle to Killian Murphy. It's a woman named Paloma Beza. She introduced him to Killian Murphy when he was casting 28 Days Later. So he occasionally gives her bit parts as like, thank you, because 28 Days Later kind of like put him on the map. Well, and Killian Murphy on the map. Yeah, and Killian Murphy on the map. And those are our fun facts. Well, thank you for shining those awesome fun facts down upon us, Paige. You are mm. welcome. You guys ready for some box office? Yes. yes. Nice. So this movie came out in 2007. What do you think its budget was? I think it's lower than you think. I think this is oh. like a $12 million movie. Okay. I'm going to say 24. Mikey, that is insanely close. Really? $23 million was the budget for this uh, movie. I'm getting better at this. Which, I mean, considering what they're able to do, $23 or $23, $23 million is is not bad. They did a good job with that money. Yeah, no, they did very good. So in its opening weekend here domestically, it came in 25th at the box office. How wide of a release did it actually get? Yeah, we'll talk about that because okay. it was released in 10 theaters yeah. that week. Oh, that's what I was thinking because I was like, I think it had a limited release and then a wide release. Right. Uh, just to put it in perspective, I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry <laughs> is what won that week. And that was in 3,495 theaters. Oh, America deserves to die sometimes, I think. <laughs> so 
I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry is what won that week. Second at the box office was Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. That's a good one, uh, though. Hairspray, Transformers, and Ratatouille uh, cleaned out your top five. Sunshine was 25th, again, only in 10 theaters, and only made $242,000 in its opening weekend. That's not good for an expensive movie. Yeah, but what about what about its real opening? I feel like this movie did did well. Okay, so let me just put it in perspective. So it was only in ten theaters that weekend, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's the next weekend it was out. It was actually in four hundred and sixty one theaters. So a big jump, but still nowhere close to the almost four thousand that the Simpsons movie that premiered that next weekend, Sunshine's second weekend out mm-hmm. was in. So the Simpsons was in four thousand or three thousand nine hundred twenty two theaters. Sunshine was only in four sixty one. And it made that weekend $1.2 million So it made quite a bit more money that weekend It's per theater average was like $2,000 Which is good I'm pretty sure I saw it Yeah, you might have So what do you think it went on to make In its total domestic run? I think it, in oh, domestic I'm going to say yeah. domestic It made $8 million Okay, Mikey, what do you think? I think this one stayed out for a long time and slowly got legs. I'm going to say 15. Okay, it made $3.6 million domestically. Now, remember that this is pretty much a UK movie. Yeah, I was going to say this is a, a, a European movie, I would say very much. Yeah, Yeah. so this didn't get a huge release in the States. Uh, you saw that it did not get like the 3,000 or almost 4,000 theater release that other big movies got. Mm. Uh, but it did internationally. So what do you guys think it made internationally? Let's do that. One. I'm going to say internationally, this probably made closer to its budget of like 20 million. Okay, Mikey, what do you think? I'm going to say it made 60 million. Okay, it made $28 million internationally, which is probably more of its domestic, if you're looking at what's domestic for the makers of this movie. Yeah. Uh, and so that puts it at a total of $23 million, and then it made another seven in domestic DVD and Blu-ray sales. And I don't have international DVD and Blu-ray sales, but I bet it made even more internationally. So this movie... I'm sure has made money and Danny Boyle has gone on to make other movies. And so, I mean, everyone in this movie is in other things. They're now. doing you know, they're fine. They're still working. <laughs> yeah. So I think this movie made money. I think, what did that Chris Evans do after this? I haven't heard from him. Yeah, I don't really know. <laughs> he's, in a, he's in a series where he has the Puerto Rican flag on his chest, but everyone calls him Captain America. So I, it's, a, it's a mixed message for me. Oh, so man. So that's your box office. <laughs> Let's hit him with that scary scale, Mikey. So scary scale is a scale of one to ten of how scary we found the film. We watched it this time. Our one example is Ghostbusters, and our ten example is Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Paige, what do you think? I'm gonna give this a three. That I mean, I don't know what it is about the flashes of those photos that just still unnerves me after seeing this so many times, but it gets me, man. I don't like it. Yeah, I'm gonna give it a three for the photo flashes and the rotisserie captain arm peel really got me. I'm gonna give it a one. <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. You've also seen it before. Cause I love that rotisserie chicken. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, you do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I think the discussion of whether or not this is a scary movie really does come down to how bad the photo flashes bug you. And they just yeah. really bug me. They're so. super unnerving. Yeah. So this week we watched Sunshine. What are you guys making me watch next week? Well, Todd, next week we are making you watch classic Terminator. Oh, dun, dun, I cannot dun, dun, dun. wait. I mean, I've already seen this movie. I haven't seen it in a good number of years, but uh, I'm excited to revisit the classic Terminator. It is one of my favorite movies of all time. That does not surprise me. I love it so much. And I know we're probably going to get a lot of flack about it not being a horror movie. And I've done some research and I will present my findings next week. (laughs) Okay. So if you don't think this is a horror movie, Mm -hmm. come prepared to get schooled to next week's episode as Paige illuminates the truth to you. Yeah, I'm going to cite sources and all kinds of shit. Oh, shit. I love it. We should also mention that we have a very special guest for next week. Paige, do you want to mention who it is? Do you want to mention or do you want to keep it a secret? It's Killian Murphy. Yeah, Yeah, guys. Killian Murphy came back from the sun. So next week, joining us for Terminator, we have a very special guest. We will be joined by Blaine Gibson of Rooster Teeth and Good Morning from Hell fame. Terminator is one of his favorite movies. I am so excited about this. And so it was the perfect person to have talk about Terminator with us. So it's going to be a blast. Very exciting. Okay. I'm excited about that. I've never met Blaine, but I'm excited. Paige says he's cool. So we'll we'll go. Blaine is cool. I've never met Blaine in person because we've technically been coworkers for the last year from a distance. Okay. Are you guys ready for a review? 
Yeah, Mikey, you got one for us to read? I do. Do you want me to read it or do you want to say the instruction? Just, I, they know the deal. Go ahead and read it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Rebecca B says, do not miss this podcast. Dear hard listeners. This one's written kind of like a letter. Are you looking for something different? <laughs> I got that from the dear horror listeners. Thanks for keeping up. <laughs> Something more than the usual <laughs> random people discussing your favorite horror movies in an unorganized and less facts-based, more opinion-based way. Then look no further than the horror version. I was like, I don't know. I feel like I'm. it's kind of unorganized and more opinionated, but that's me. I mean, listen, I'll take either one. I'm just, I'm just glad you're listening. The virgin slick stick. Stick. How do you say that? Stick. Stick. It's stick. stick. Yeah. Uh, never gets old because we horror fans love to feed off the fear of norms being scared. <laughs> I guess I'm a norm. Yeah. I don't think so, but maybe for <laughs> horror movies. That's fair. <laughs> All three hosts do their fair share of research, not just opinion based, but fact based. And there is an organized format that loosely keeps everyone on topic. Now, I, th I say we've been we've gotten decent with that. OK, most importantly, all people <laughs> of all walks of life are respected. And yet it's still fun and funny AF. Nice. More than just a hark podcast. This is a community. So scroll through to find your favorite movie review and press play. You will not, with all caps, be disappointed much love from Rebecca via the Hellmouth, which is a Buffy the Vampire reference, I'm aware. And uh, Cleveland, <laughs> heart emoji, five stars. Aww, well, thank you yay. so much, Rebecca B., for that amazing, thoughtful review. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And if you want to have your review run on the podcast, leave us a five-star text review, and Mikey will read it. I can't believe we're over 650 reviews. That's insane. That is crazy. So, guys, if you like this show but want to hear this power thruple on another movie review show about romance and romantic comedies, check out Romancing the Pod, where Mikey, Paige, and I break down and make fun of romantic movies. It's a lot of fun, guys. Check it out. If you want to follow us on social, please do. We are at Horror Virgin or online at HorrorVirgin.com. If you want to follow us all individually, you can do that as well. Paige is at Paige Wesley on Twitter or Rampage Wesley everywhere else, including TikTok. Mikey is at M Randolph 24 and I am at Todd J Awesome. If you like the show so much and you want to help financially support it, please do by going to patreon.com slash horror virgin where you can get a lot of great levels and a lot of great stuff like bonus episodes, director's cut episodes where they're a little bit longer and you get them actually a day earlier mm -hmm, than the mm -hmm. regular feed drop. We do a lot of great things like listener requests and stuff like that. So guys, check out yeah. the Patreon and help support the show. If if you want to financially support me, but not Todd, just look me up on Venmo. Or his OnlyFans, which really should just be called Only Feet <laughs> because that's what you get. But guys... <laughs> <laughs> but it's just because I don't know how to work my camera phone. <laughs> he doesn't know how to hit the front-facing <laughs> camera button, so it's always just a picture of his feet. Anyway, guys, if you can't financially support the show, that's understandable, that's fine, but if you want to hang out with us on the daily, join the Facebook group uh, at facebook.com slash group slash horror virgin. We also link it like once a week, so just find it there and join the awesome Facebook group. We're closing in on 1,600 members. It's amazing. You guys are awesome. And literally, we're in there talking every day. It's awesome. This episode was brought to you by Nick, Nick B. B. Fun fact about Nick B. Oh, yeah? He uses his oxygen garden to grow pot. <laughs> <laughs> is pot legal in the UK? It is in space. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't realize that Nick B had transitioned to space. So, okay. Nice. Cool, 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 cool. All right. I do think it is also legal in the UK. Now that we have two Democratic senators from Georgia, it's about to be legal in the U.S. Woohoo! This episode also brought to you by Ori. Ori. Ori sent us gourmet holiday popcorn and cheddar, caramel, and regular flavor. And regular flavored popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> which is impressive because we don't have a P.O. box yet. Which, guys, we need to do that, by the way. I've been thinking about that for like two weeks now. Yeah. And the tin was covered in blood. Oh, that took a turn. <laughs> it was the blood of the innocents. That, it, it was the perfect worse. amount of salty. Yeah. <laughs> it was it's covered that in good skin. rotisserie Ro blood, though. Rotisserie skin, yeah. Yeah, yeah. rotisserie skin blood. If you're going to send us popcorn, though, guys, make it Garrett's popcorn from Chicago. That junk is the best. Is that the one that you, Oprah loves? I don't know, but probably because she lives in Chicago. Ori, thank you so much for the popcorn that you did or did not send. This episode also brought to you by Awesome Possum Blossom. And Awesome Possum Blossom wants me to give you some Awesome Possum Not Blossom facts. 
So here's one for you. They're social creatures. It was long assumed that possums like to keep to themselves, but a study published by the journal Biology Letters suggests that they have a social side. Researchers at the Federal University of someplace in Brazil observed (laughs) some possums in captivity sharing dens even if they weren't mates. In one case, 13 white-eared possums of various age groups were cohabitating in the same space. Scientists suspect that male and female possums living in the wild may even build nests together as a way to trigger the female's reproductive hormones. So, Mikey, I have an idea (laughs) about your current living situation. No, no, no. You can see those possums all living together in that show, Oh, Friend. (laughs) Oh, like friends, but oh, possum. Oh, God. Okay. Yes, yes, you got there. Oh, God. Oh, my God. It was such a journey. It's not about Welcome. the journey. It's about the destination. <laughs> the real joke is the friends we made along the way. <laughs> the old friends you made along the way. <laughs> and guys, if you're looking for awesome stuff to feed your possum, check out Bug Cage Company on Facebook, Brandon's Bug Business. They can hook you up with any kind of bug you want, whether it's a tarantula, spider, scorpion, centipede, millipede, or other repeat needs. And Brandon, thank you so much for being an awesome supporter of the podcast. So no one told you bugs were gonna taste so great. <laughs> <laughs> oh man now i'm just picturing two possums living across the, the hallway from two other possums and there's like a really will they won't they vibe between two of them because they know but now they know that they think that we know that they know that we know and the show is secretly terrible those possums were on a break <laughs> <laughs> they were on a branch <laughs> <laughs> they were on an O break we now return you to another episode of uh, the, the Patreonicals. Okay, so uh, they're at Mammotopia. We've come full circle, Paige. <laughs> anyway, um, the koalas are like, you guys abandoned us. We're really mad at y'all. And we joined sides with the Illuminati because they promised to protect us and they helped us rebuild Mammotopia. I mean, that's what happens when you leave. A power vacuum happens and then someone comes in to fill that space. That's true. Oh, that's, that's what Eddie hears, but everybody else is just hearing. <laughs> because Eddie's the only one that can hear them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So Eddie turns everybody. He's like, the koalas have turned on us, and they, Mammotopia is in the possession of the Illuminati. They seem really pissed, and all of them have chlamydia, so we got to watch out. <laughs> Accurate to koalas. Yeah. Like, look it up, guys. Google it. It, it. it is like an elder care facility. Everyone's got an STD. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, so, and so the koalas are like, you know, Prepare to die. So immediately, Isaac just eats a koala. <laughs> just to show dominance? <laughs> just to, sh- like, you know. Honestly, it's just good to see Isaac eating things that aren't people. Evil Matthew punts one. Because <laughs> Eddie was like, they're going to try to kill us. Evil Matthew, shame on you. Karun is still kind of crying because he was made fun of by the space aliens. and It uh, hurts, man. When your friends kind of turn on you and make fun of your feet. Or how much you layer, like it really hurts. I get it, Karun. What are you trying to say? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like Karun's like finally realizing that he's gonna be stuck on this hellhole planet with the rest of us. Yeah. <laughs> so he's just like going in a ball and crying into a corner. But then a <laughs> giant dog, it's my dog, Macy, shows up and it's like I like how Macy survived the apocalypse and you didn't. Macy would survive (laughs) the apocalypse. I don't know if we've survived or not, Paige. We haven't gotten to that. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Dylan, out of nowhere, is like, oh, my God, that's the dog that killed my whole family. What? (laughs) What? And then Macy, who speaks perfect English and doesn't need Eddie to translate, was like, I did kill your family. (laughs) I super enjoyed it. It wasn't even rough. Oh. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> and then he just says, bad dog. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, he says bad dog, but then Macy was like, you know, it must suck to I ate your children. And, and so, like. <laughs> She's just you know, taunting Dylan him about crying. it? Yes. That's real dark. Your dog sucks, man. <laughs> I know. Your dog's know. a sociopath. So Dylan, like, tears up and is, like, having a real emotional moment. And then yeah. Tristam tries to shoot Macy with the arm cannon. And Macy uh, gnaws on the arm cannon and kind of crushes it in. She has super strength for some reason. Okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then Amy, who they brought from the space station, is like, what the actual fuck is all this? 
and then gets hit by Macy's tail and flies flies off and it just not flies off but like gets knocked to the ground. Yeah. And um, Sasha is like trying to like fight a bunch of koalas. They're super cute, so they don't want to like hurt them. But she's like struggling with that. And um, Ma- Macy almost kills Sasha, but Kate stops Macy with her telekinesis, but can't hold her back. Is like stopped and paused her and was like, "You guys need to fight the koalas. I don't have much energy to fight this demon dog." And uh, it's all chaos around them, and then everybody might die soon. And that's the end of the episode. Wow, I had no idea Macy was basically Cerberus. She is. She's Cerberus. Is Amy ever going to wake up after being struck by Macy's tail? How far can someone actually punt a koala? When did Macy start paying us 50 bucks a month? <laughs> Find out next week on another episode of The Patreonicals. Oh, man. That's going to be it for us, you guys. I'm Paige. I'm Mikey. And I'm your horror virgin Todd, guys. Keep it ooky spooky. Have Ooh. an amazing week. Bye. Oh, wow. Yeah. Bye. Shiny nerds. <laughs>